and I'm going to go live on Facebook. The Voice. Okay. Uh, hang on. Let me actually do this. Is this better? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to History Matters, and as ever, and really now, so does coffee. Um, so uh, today, as you could see, Matt could not be here. Grace has kindly offered to stand in. So Grace, we much appreciate your willingness to to come and, and stand in here and, and serve the History Matters community. So um, I, I salute you and I enjoy working with you. So this will be fun. Thank you for putting up with me. I'm delighted to be with you all today. <laughs> and again, I, as you can see, I, I brought John Chupegi, who is our director of conferences. Um, and he very nicely made sure that I did push, he pushed record so that I didn't mess it up. So I'm thrilled to be here and now, now we can not worry about it. <laughs> exactly, we're recording. I can see that we are now live on Facebook. Life is good. Excellent. Indeed. Actually, let me close chat because then I'm just gonna get to engage. There we go. Okay, now I can focus on this. Okay, so um, I think uh, as we are looming here before Thanksgiving, as I, first of all, as I said on um, Twitter, uh, and as NCHE said uh, in their tweet message, we're going to be talking about surprise censuring uh, today. I wonder why. Actually, I'm going to, um, it's very bright. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, censuring. I'm not going to explain why because I don't need to. Um, I don't think, I think because we're before Thanksgiving, there isn't NCH news today. Is that correct? Grace? Grace. There isn't NCH news. No, is there or isn't there? In other words, should I turn to my partner in crime? <laughs> oh well, I mean, I can, I can, I can say the usual thing where we're we're excited. Yes, to be here with Dr. Joanne Freeman. Thank you again for your 85th episode. Um, I'm Grace Leatherman. I'm the executive director. If any of you haven't seen me before, of the National Council for History Education, so we welcome you to this event. Um, again, we just so admire this community and thank Joanne for all of her service doing this. And just as a reminder. By all means, participate in the chat. We have quite a lively community here. There is bingo going on. Uh, but also, if you have questions for Joanne, I will pop back on after Joanne presents and we will hear some of your questions so you can participate. Please put them in the Q&A and I will be sharing those with Joanne live and just keep everything family friendly. We are delighted to have a, a family and community show here. So uh, yes, with that, um, again, if you're interested in NCHE, interested in becoming a member or our other events, we're at nchteach.org. But we're just excited to have you all here this morning. So I will pass it to Joanne. Wonderful. OK, thank you. Yeah, how could I forget the rules of the game? Man, what's wrong with me? OK, uh, oops. I, you know, it's like year two, and I'm still messing around with Zoom. <laughs> OK, um, so as uh, mentioned a moment ago, uh, we're going to be talking about censoring. Um, I, because what I think probably people, it would be useful for people to understand on this, our 85th episode, which I forgot to say, man, the coffee This is right before Thanksgiving break, and I'm tired. Um, however, um, I wanted to give a little background about censuring uh, and what it means and how it has worked in the past uh, and some of the implications when people get censured. I think these will be very interesting uh, given some of what's going on today and actually some other sort of recent uh, events, which you'll hear. Um, as I sort of launch into what I'm going to talk about today, a little bit, some of it is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that a bit and then circle back at the end to why, um, despite some of the things I'm going to say, centering really truly is an important thing. Um, now, the, the first thing I want to say is there are actually, um, I suppose, three formal ways uh, that you can punish someone for doing something unacceptable. And the most obvious one is to expel them from Congress. And that's the least deployed of the punishments, but it is a punishment. It has happened before. Censuring, if there's like a spectrum of punishment, censuring is the next down. And underneath that, and it's a has only been uh, used and I assume created in the 20th century, is reprimanding someone, which is definitely less of a hand slap, it's more of a hand slap actually and less of a punishment than censuring uh, because, because it does not have the public component. And those of you who were watching the censure happen saw that um, Congressman Gosar had to go and stand uh, in the, the well of the house or what would have been called the bar of the house in the 19th century. 
uh, and receive in front of the House, and I suppose in front of ultimately the nation, uh, punishment for what he had done. Now, the interesting thing about that, and speaking as a historian, I could, um, I was feeling this in my bones and then watching it not matter. <laughs> that, you know, the idea of forcing someone to stand up that way in front of Congress and the, in front of the press and now in, like instantly in front of the world to be censured that way was, it's supposed to be humiliating. <laughs> you know, it's, there's supposed to be an actual aspect of punishment to the idea that you are being um, really, you know, not just reprimanded, but, but censured, meaning you have crossed a serious line and we are going to announce that to the world because it's important and the world needs to see that there is a line and that you, person standing right there, have crossed it. It's supposed to be <laughs> humiliating, right? So I'm watching it and I'm thinking, wow, like, you know, it, it's, um, I think uh, uh, Charles Rangel was the last person to get censured a little while back. Uh, it doesn't happen all that often. So again, as a historian, I, you know, watching it and I'm part of me, as, as always, I always talk about the, the mini brains. Uh, I should have had my mug of the brains of Joanne Freeman. Um, historian brain, I was like, wow, like this is real censure and reminds me of what's supposed to be the mortification, the humiliation of going through this. And then, you know, current day US citizen brain was, yeah, it really doesn't seem to matter much to anybody in that room. Not only that, but um, as I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, he got applauded in some ways for having done the sin and being censured for it. And he clearly wasn't repentant in any way. So um, historian brain was, observing, appreciating, and um, current citizen brain was irritated. Okay, but so here's the thing to, th to remember, one of the many things to remember about censuring, um, and that is it's public, it's supposed to be public, that's supposed to be humiliating, but that also means it has an audience and it has a multi-layered audience. And this has always been true. It obviously is more complicated and instant now because of technology, but if you think about it, that kind of ritual, so the person standing up and being censured, they're standing up obviously before Congress. They are standing up before the press. They are there by standing up before their constituents. They are standing up before their base. All of these are people who will know this is happening and because it's so public, truly will know that it's happening. They are standing up before the nation and, and this is significant, they are standing up before their opponents. So there's a real layered audience here and they're all being appealed to in one way or another in that act. It's not necessarily the intent, as you'll hear, uh, the kind of appeal that's made, uh, again, is kind of counterintuitive, but all of those audiences are in play when that kind of ritual takes place. Now, along the same lines, some of the sins that lead to censure have the same audience, right? So what we're talking about in some ways here, um, particularly not so much, you know, if you commit a corrupt act and get censured for it in some way, um, that's not the same as putting an offensive video on Twitter, for example. Um, there are some things that you do that are public and then are noticed and then are acted upon. And if you're, you're serious enough, you get censured. Um, but the thing about the publicity of this is, and this goes back, we're gonna move back into history now to the, it's my book looming over my shoulder. Some of the things I wrote about in my book is that um, historically speaking, and this has always been true, some people really like a member of Congress to fight for their rights. And I mean fight in a very literal sense, right? That, that, and in the 19th century, these people would have been called bullies. They were clearly identifiable. There were bullies around and they played a rough game, game of politics. And often they were put in office. They were elected to Congress explicitly because they played that rough game. So there are some, it's, so it's not necessarily in a simpler world, uh, you would say that someone behaves badly and it is bad and they get reprimanded and they are humiliated and other people do not want to do that again because of the humiliation of being censured. And that would be a nice world. But <laughs> I 
actually um, some of the behavior that deserves censure and sometimes even gets it uh, has appealed to it to some people, may benefit them for having done it, um, it appeals differently to different audiences and significantly, and I have spoken about this now, I don't know, like four different times on TV in the last week, it's meant to be, particularly in this case, it's meant to be a threat. It's not a joke. It's not funny. If you are showing a video of you killing somebody, I'm sorry, but even if it's a cartoon, it's not a joke. It's a threat. And, you know, historically speaking, when you're looking at all of the behavior that I talk about in my book, um, when you commit an act like that, for it to be threatening, it doesn't have to be directly violent. It doesn't have to be violent at all. It, it can be as seemingly abstract as a cartoon, as an anime, you know, cartoon. It can be someone standing up and um, saying some, something threatening to you in Congress, but doing nothing more. It can be, in the time period I write about, someone seemingly threatening um, you with a duel because of something you've done. Or, um, as in one instance, a, a Louisiana congressman walking up to somebody and who, who said something he didn't like and saying, if you do that again, I'm going to cut your throat. Didn't do anything. He just said, wow, I'm going to cut your throat. That's actually <laughs> less direct than what we just saw on Twitter. Um, that's definitely a threat, right? That's And the person who received that threat took it that way and talked about it that way. So the part of the importance of what I'm talking about here is that some of this behavior is explicitly in addition to appealing to the base and appealing to constituents and appealing to people who will be pleased that this individual is fighting for their rights or you know fighting for them or whatever way you want to interpret fighting. Um, in addition to that, the other half of the message is, you know, you people who are opposed to me, um, here you go. This is where I stand and this is the language I speak and my people like it. That's a threat. And that's, you know, the, the um, power of the slave power in the decades I talk about in my book, the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, part of that power is simply the fact that the slave power, the, the individuals who fit into that category are people who are obviously willing to be violent. They aren't necessarily violent, but they're really willing to be. And it only takes one or two acts of actual violence to communicate the message that it could happen. And if you believe that these people might be violent, you're going to hold back, you're going to restrain yourself a little bit, you're going to think twice before speaking. It will have an impact. It's intimidation. It, it's an effort to intimidate and silence people who might think about otherwise speaking up. Now let's look for a moment um, at the sort of dynamics of what happens um, with an actual censure. Um, and the one I'm going to uh, talk about here happened in 1842, um, and it's Ohio um, abolitionist Joshua Giddings. Um, I'm sure I've talked about him before because he's a real character and a real fighter against slavery. So um, Joshua Giddings, so this is in the era of the gag rule, which said that you could not discuss um, anti-slavery petitions. It was trying to gag discussion of abolitionism and anti-slavery, anything, basically just sort of shut that down. And Giddings, who is a big guy, you know, uh, a sort of physically intimidating guy, and he re not only was he not afraid of fighting, he kind of welcomed a good fight. Um, he called, at one point, I can't, I didn't look up the quote, at one point he says something like, it's good sport, right? So he's in the right place at the right time. To, ha to be someone of strong principles and to have principles that people who are violent don't like. So in 1842, uh, he makes, he, he offers resolutions to Congress uh, in regard to um, a ship transporting enslaved people that there was a mutiny aboard it. And Giddings basically supports the mutiny, right? Offers these resolutions saying that the government has no right to um, interfere by punishing people or anything in this case, because the people who committed you know, sort of rose up, the, the enslaved people who rose up on that ship had every right to do it, and they should have done it, and um, they should actually, in a sense, be rewarded and certainly not punished for whatever took place. Now, okay, so this is during the gag rule era. Anytime that would have been a problem in the gag rule era, that's clearly, like, flaunting, you know, in-your-face aggression. 
Now, I should say Giddings, um, get, in the book, I call him an anti-slavery Toreador um, because he would deliberately do very offensive things. I mean, offensive meaning things Southerners wouldn't like. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this at the end of my comments this morning. Deliberately to upset them. And, and then they would do something, you know, they would run at him with a cane or uh, start screaming at him. And he's a Toreador because, you know, it's like he waves the, 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 the cape, the red flag, and then the Southerners start, Gah! and then Giddings would say, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the slave power, <laughs> right? And they would be totally deflated and they would look like a bunch of howling barbarians and they would sit down. He was really good at that. So, you know, in this case, he is making these resolutions strongly anti-slavery. He's done stuff like this before. Um, there's a fuss, people get angry, they threaten him. He gets physically threatened at least seven times during his congressional career. In this case, because of the gag rule, um, he ends up being censured. He, he is censured in part um, because John Quincy Adams would do the same sorts of things, but John Quincy Adams, when he's in Congress in this period, he's an ex-president and the son of a founder and an elderly person who is a brilliant master of parliamentary maneuvering and had people on the floor, at least some, who would support him. Giddings is less of a brilliant parliamentary maneuverer. Adams, John Quincy Adams, during the t discussion about censure, tries to find a way to stop it from happening and can't. Giddings didn't have a, a lot of strong friends on the floor who were able to stand up uh, in the way that they should have, and the Southerners and people who were trying to shut him down really effectively used parliamentary maneuvering to, to prevent him from speaking. He never had a chance even to defend himself. He was just centered. Um, someone at some point early on called the previous question, which basically means, and now we're going to vote on it. Um, and so he's silenced uh, and then censured. Uh, and in protest against what at the time was considered a very offensive act being censured, he resigns, goes back to Ohio. John Quincy Adams is stunned, right? He says, I don't, I think something like, I cannot find the words. Like I always told Giddings not to worry about what the slaveholders do. Like they're just a bunch of bullies, but I, like, I didn't expect this to happen. He's, he's kind of stunned. But here's the thing about what happens here. So he does something that Southerners consider offensive that um, violate the gag rule enough that he is censured, he resigns, he goes home, and is wildly applauded back in Ohio. There are town meetings passing resolutions that applaud Giddings anti-slavery sentiments, that denounce what they consider to be the violation of their rights by the censuring of Giddings. Um, there's one, for example, that says the censure, quote, insulted the whole North. And, and this is the key part, Giddings runs again for Congress and wins in a landslide. He is reelected, and this is the vote count, 7,469 to 393. That's, so he's really landslide put right back and he's running against a pro-slavery Democrat. He's a Whig. So he gets cheered and his act that he did brings him back truly with a mandate to Congress to the point that his opponents, actually Henry Wise, who I think I've talked about before, of Virginia, who is my most frequent fighter in Congress uh, and was very, you know, he wasn't really afraid to roll up his sleeve and slug people. He, he very ruefully says when Giddings returns, this massive mandate, he says that Giddings has achieved the greatest, the, sorry, I'll go back on that, that, that this is the greatest triumph achieved by a member of the House. Wise knows precisely what happened there. Okay, going along the same pattern, Preston Brooks, who canes Charles Sumner, and Lawrence Kitt, who held people back from intervening and helping Sumner. Now, Preston Brooks ultimately is not expelled. There's a discussion of it. He isn't expelled, but because he's not even formally censured, but because of that debate and the way in which he's being denounced, he resigns his seat. Lawrence Kitt is actually censured um, for what he did to sort of help the fight continue. He resigns too. And they're both reelected. Like, yay guys, you know, you stood up for us and you were punished and the punishment shows. 
that you're our guys. Um, I think uh, I, I was on Chris Hayes last night and he said something like um, that there, there are these attaboy letters now being sent to Gosar. And I love that. It's like basically attaboy is, is sort of what was being said to these people at the time. Same time period, Anson Burlingame, who um, stands up and uh, offers basically to duel with Preston Brooks, but um, says if, he'll, if, if there's going to be a duel, it's going to be in the north. So, you know, says to Brooks, okay, I'll stand up to you. I'll duel you. Eat me at Niagara Falls. And of course, Brooks can't travel through the north. So some people are like, that's cowardly, but northerners love it. And so Burlingame is celebrated, widely celebrated. He writes, he, he does a, a sort of Western um, sort of loop at this moment. And people come from everywhere to like cheer him on. And there are people dressed up as the state of Kansas. Don't ask me what that looks like, because I don't know, but <laughs> there are people dressed as Kansas. And he writes to his wife, the whole population of the West seems wild to see your naughty husband because he did not run away from Brooks. The people like such bad men as I am. He got, he was praised among other things uh, with a banner that read, uh, a gentleman who believes in the defense of freedom and also in self-defense. So part of the point I'm making here, as I said, counterintuitive and not very um, comforting, uh, is that people who are fighters, who engage in that kind of behavior, often are rewarded for it. They're performing it so often, and performing it doesn't mean it doesn't matter or that it's not intended to be violent. It just means they know they have an audience and they're partly doing it because of that audience. They get celebrated for it. They get support for it. They sometimes get a mandate for it. Um, and I know other people who have behaved badly in Congress, I won't name names, but we all know who they are right now. Um, when they do something really offensive, they make massive amounts of money, right? Supporters jump, line up and say, you know, yay, you're our kind of bully and, and send them money. So this is part of the dynamic and we're going to watch that happen now where Gosar is going to get all kinds of funding and support because he did this thing and was punished for it. And not only that, after being punished for it, he retweeted, retweeted a video. So he's really not repentant, right? He's like, yeah, I did it. I'll do it again. He's going to get celebrated for that. And he's going to make a ton of money for that. So the obvious question is, does that mean people should not be censured? If the result of that kind of punishment is going to be um, people who support the, the crime stepping up and saying, not only did you do the crime, but you got punished for it even better. Like now we're really going to stand behind you. Does that mean it shouldn't happen? Should people not be censured because of the reward involved? Um, and I, for a number of reasons, the answer to that is no, it, it should still happen. And here's why. Number one, enforcing rules matters, right? Even if by enforcing them, you are doing some good for the person being reprimanded or punished. It's worse if you don't enforce the rules. If you don't enforce the rules, you're basically welcoming anyone and everyone who wants to behave badly, come on up, right? There's no penalty at all. And the, the tone and tenor of this institution and the way it runs, really, you know, bullying is just kind of the way it runs. There's a big penalty, I think, to just saying, eh, we're not going to enforce the rules. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've spoken before about not responding to something like January 6th is just an invitation for it to happen again, because it gets all kinds of attention. And, um, you know, the, the average Americans are getting punished. Others who are inside Congress who might have been involved are not. Um, and anything that's major like that that happens that's violent or offensive or clearly violates the rules that is just ignored, that's basically announcing that it's acceptable. That's what it does. So despite everything I just said about the fact that this censure is going to help him in some ways, not enforcing the rules and not censuring him is worse. So for that alone, I think it's important. Also, and I've said this a bazillion times before, accountability really, really matters. The censure held him accountable. Again, we can say like, yeah, but he's going to be rewarded for it. I know. But what it 
says and by enforcing the rules is this person did an offensive thing and we're making him personally accountable for it. If nothing else, the essence of a democratic system of government is accountability, the accountability of the people we give power to, the people we put in office. They are accountable to us. And we need to hold them accountable and we need to know what they do and be able to register our opinion of it. Accountability is what makes a democracy a democracy because what it means is people with power don't have a right to just keep it. They're accountable to us and we can remove them if we want in elections, but still, accountability is vital, vital, vital in spirit and in practice to democratic governance. So for that reason too, enforcing the rules and pointing the finger at this person and saying, you did a bad thing, you are accountable for your actions. You did it, we're blaming you, finger pointing. Okay, so at least there has been accountability sort of registered. Also, and this gets back to um, Joshua Giddings being um, an anti-slavery Toreador, um, sometimes exposing people who violate the rules can matter. For Giddings, and he was brilliant, he would get people, like, like he would deliberately say offensive things um, or, or call a Southerner a coward. I mean, he like way out on the edge, right? He would do these extreme things. And it, it's almost comic, almost like slapstick that a Southerner, and this happened more than once, would like jump to his feet in outrage with a cane and like begin to run at Giddings. And he literally, not, not quoting the, these exact words, but it's pretty much what he would do, as I said before. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the slave power. And he's basically enticing people to behave, the word at the time would have been barbarians, to behave like barbarians, and then points the finger at them and says, you know, there's a person behaving like a barbarian. Just want you all to see that's what they're doing. Now, this is this is an interesting thought. This is, um, in a moment or two, I'll end here because I want to open things up for questions. Um, that's an interesting idea, right? So right now, um, we have the censure and some of the commentary on ghosts are um, folks who like it can point to, you know, people on the left who are offended and say, oh, it's a bunch of pearl clutching, right? Like it's fake. It's like, I'm shocked. I am shocked, you know, that somehow or other it's all for performance. Um, maybe pearl clutching isn't the most effective thing to do here. Maybe finger pointing's better. Maybe Joshua Giddings. Maybe he has a point. Maybe instead of saying, you know, that's horrible, that's offensive, which deserves to be said and should be said, maybe it would also behoove people who don't like that kind of behavior to say, and there you have the modern day GOP doing what it does. That's what they stand for. What if we get Toreadors who effectively say, yeah, they're doing that thing. Here they are doing that thing, behaving in this way. Huh, wow, essentially, Kind of barbaric, huh? Not really good behavior. Rather than just being offended and sort of sitting in that space. Now I'm not, I am obviously not a political strategist, but Giddings' behavior and the fact that that had some power and the fact that it really bothered Southerners who fell for it every time and then other Southerners would like rush up, like drag them off the floor, like, no, don't fall for it again. Um, basically, at the time, people who, stood up to that kind of behavior, and by that I mean just didn't run from it, um, that made a point. So, I, you know, I'm not actually sitting here and saying um, in today's environment that the Democrats should behave exactly the same. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is it, it might be interesting to think about the best way to respond to this kind of behavior and that um, deeming it bad, acknowledging that it's bad, acknowledging all the ways it's doing bad, enforcing rules, censoring people who deserve it, discussing it in the press, exposing the people who are doing these things, all of those things are good, but it might be interesting to think about what would happen if in that mix of responses, there's also like, and boy, this is just what you expect from these guys behaving just this way. Not so much um, uh, being shocked, being mocking they can't hold themselves together like they all they have is this isn't that sad one of the most effective so so Giddings in this time period is 
really effective at this because he's a big guy. The other person who's effective at this kind of thing uh, is John Parker Hale, New Hampshire senator. And if you're going to be a, a, a strong anti-slavery person, abolitionist, you better have a, 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 a sort of shtick. You better have something you can resort to to protect yourself. And for Hale, it was humor. So some Southerner would get all worked up and red-faced and start threatening him. Uh, and Hale would always respond, he had a really good sense of humor, with a real powerful sort of comeback uh, that would get the, the room, the Senate, to laugh. And then the Southerner, like red-faced, standing up there with a weapon, would be like, like you could see him deflate <laughs> and then it would be over right so i guess I, I i as a historian i do not offer solutions for current day problems but given the history of people behaving badly being rewarded for that kind of behavior it's interesting to think about the ways in which we might respond to that kind of behavior that acknowledge that fact and even potentially take advantage of it okay um someone i know must be yelling mug 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 right now so uh, I'm gonna do the mug, mug, mug moments. Okay, so if there's folks here um, who are new, um, of course, so we've 85 weeks for 85, 84 weeks up until now, uh, I have a mug that I reveal that in some way connects to the theme. I do not have um, 85 mugs. <laughs> there's been repeat, but um, the mug I have today, you have to follow me along here because it's, it, it's relevant, but perhaps not obvious. Um, so it, it says um, on caffeine, but it's on, from the, the uh, NPR show On the Media. Which, see, it says On the Media right there. So this is a mug talking about the fact that the media is commenting on these kinds of things and needs to comment on these kinds of things, and we need to think about what that means or how we deal with them. So it's directly related. It's just not a slap in your face kind of directly related. So that's that's the the mug for today, which I, I just love. I also just love the fact any mug that has something to do with being over caffeinated, <laughs> I'm in. Now, uh, the other thing that we do every week, and today, Grace, you have the honor, uh, is we have a background that has something to do with the theme at hand. So I will turn to you, Grace. Well, I do want to note that you are complimented that you mentioned your mug before anyone yelled it in the chat. So they want you. That might be that. the first time. <laughs> you did that all by yourself. Wow, that's that's because you guys have trained me really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could feel them about to type it. So mine may not be as creative as usual. I think I think someone already got it. So so uh, this is not in fact the offices of NCHE. Uh, <laughs> The so opposite what is of the closet. Here? <laughs> yes, this is not our NCHE closet. Are people guessing? Speaker's lobby. Oh. Yeah, so this is this is the hallway outside the House of Represent the entrance to the House of Representatives. So um if you're if you're a you watched West Wing, they're always doing stuff in the hallways. That's where all the deals get me. <laughs> I, I thought it was unusual and beautiful and it actually yeah, so that's really where is. I am today. So, I, so I'm hanging out right outside where the where the drama takes place right here. And it's it actually is really beautiful, which is kind of nice. And yeah. actually, because the institution of Congress is an institution, and it's easy to forget that given the insanity. So that's kind of a nice reminder, like, hey, look, it's an institution with gravitas. <laughs> How nice. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, Carol Lee didn't see the mug. You just hold the mug up again. Oh, Carol Lee. On caffeine. Um, it says on caffeine, but the connection is it's from on the media. Uh, and so this is about exposing the people who are behaving badly. Um, and so that is the connection. Carolee, I, I, oh, your Wi-Fi failed. Okay. I was like, what did, oh my did gosh. I must have done something wrong? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was so proud. That's why no one yelled mug. That's why. Well, That's why. Still, you, I, you get credit for doing that. I, it's because Carolee particularly has trained me really well. So you did, you've done good work, Carolee. Yeah. So you do have lots of questions. And uh, for the rest, if you're still thinking of questions, please continue to put them in the Q&A. But we do have lots of very educational questions here, many of which relate to uh, Joanne's historical experience. So that's very, very helpful here. So let's see. Um, would you call Franklin's experience in the pit a censure or something more serious? Franklin. Who are we talking about? Uh, this is a question from Dale. So I think I believe he's asking about 
Um, you're asking about Ben Franklin Dale. I have to admit that I am not remembering this incident. So maybe we'll, we'll come back to that one and Dale can share a little bit more with us. Um, all right, so let's say, so Dave says, um, Representative Gosar compared his being censured to Alexander Hamilton, if I heard that correctly. Is there yes. any relation between the two? No, but let me explain that. I actually um, looked that up explicitly so that I could be sure that, because I, and I was going to include it in my comments, and I thought it's going to come up. Y you know, <laughs> uh, just any way in which anything like went to Hal Alexander Hamilton coming up, apparently Kevin McCarthy last night seemingly referenced my book, although he didn't use the name. He talked about the dirty floors uh, and the spittoons and the fighting. I, I, and I was like, oh, good. <laughs> I'm so glad that my book is so useful now. Um, but as far as Hamilton goes, there was an attempt to censure him. Um, but there's all the ways in which it's not similar. Um, Republicans, uh, and Jefferson particularly by this point, this is 1793, really wanted Hamilton out in any way that they could get him out. So um, there's a maneuver that Hamilton makes uh, by mixing up funds that are meant for foreign loans and funds that are meant domestically. Uh, and he crosses one with the other in some way that's not quite kosher. Uh, and when he's asked about it, he, he basically says, well, you know, the president gave me permission. Uh, and he goes to the president and says, right, you gave me permission, right? And Washington's like, I don't really fully remember that, which leaves Hamilton in trouble. So um, there's an attempt to censure him for misbehaving as secretary of the treasury. The person who drafts the center revolutions is Thomas Jefferson. And among them are, you know, boot him, get him out of here. Let's, this is our moment. And those resolutions are rewritten by a member of Congress and slightly tweaked. And there is an attempt to censure Hamilton who comes forward and, you know, has lengthy reports explaining in extreme detail the many ways in which he really didn't do something wrong. And they are unable to censure him because there really isn't anything for them to hang on to to censure him for. So in this case, maybe Hamilton did something wrong or maybe he didn't. He explains all the details. He has all the receipts. Um, you know, it's just not the same and he is not censured. So um, if you're going to compare yourself with Hamilton um, and suggest, you know, possibly you didn't do anything. Yeah, well, that's not going to work in this case. <laughs> You might some very different cases there. Very, very, very different cases. So anyway, yes. But but I was surprised when Hamilton's name came up uh, just because there's so much history sort of lurking around that, you know, like McCarthy mentioning spittoons in the floor of Congress. You know, I was like, my book starts with that. And I don't know anyone else who's written about the floor of the House of Representatives in great detail. You know, and I looked up like environmental reports and I found very explicitly what the floor looked like. Like, I was like, if you're talking about the dirty floor, and he's like, you know, because someone, I only know this because someone sent it to me. You know, the floor looks so clean now. It didn't look clean back at, in the past. Like, it was dirty. There were spittoons. Was, everyone was contacting me and saying, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> your, your expertise has become, I mean, it always was critical. And at this particular moment, it is really specifically useful. Yikes. Um, okay. Anyway, so that's the that's the answer to the the Hamilton question. Thank you. Yes. Um, are there many instances of the majority party censuring members of their own caucus, or has the tool always been more political partisan? No. Charles Rangel uh, is a Democrat, and he is censured by Democrats. Actually, Nancy Pelosi delivers the punishment. So, no, it is not always a partisan tool. Sometimes it actually does have something to do. <laughs> with everyone recognizing that someone has done something wrong. And in that case, it's a it's bipartisan support for that censure. So there are times when people in that case, you know, come together as an institution to make a point, to make a statement. So it can be used in a party driven kind of a way, but it certainly has not always been used that way. Good to know. So there's actually quite a bit of, of wondering about an actual expulsion. So Susan wants to know how bad do you actually have to be to be expelled? <laughs> right, because that's a, that's pretty extreme. I, I I meant to look up and didn't. I want to say there's like five people or six people um, that have actually been expelled from Congress in congressional history, and I didn't look up what the particular sin was. But um, if you think about the fact that Preston Brooks caned Sumner into a bloody mess uh, and was not expelled. They talked about it. They didn't expel him. 
uh, it tells you that that's a hard thing to do. I don't, the problem with answering that as to how bad you have to be is that um, there's no, it's so, the sin sometimes is so planted in the moment that, and it might seem horrible at the time, uh, and two years later, even at the time, it would seem quaint. So for example, um, the first actual censure um, was of a member of Congress who insulted the speaker by saying the speaker clearly had his eyes on the presidency. <laughs> and he and he got censured. That's 1832, I think. So it's 10 years. I think Giddings is the next one. Um, so, you know, at that time, that's, you know, Jacksonian politics. That's a party thing. It, you know, in the moment, it, it, I don't, again, I don't have the exact words, but it could have been very personal and a personal insult of that kind in Congress from one member to another member really violates protocol, but um, just not even getting to expulsion, but just in censure, that's the, the first actual censure is that. So, you know, you can't, there's a big spectrum of that fall that can enable any of these punishments to happen, but the, the crime and the punishment sort of might suit each other at the moment. Um, and, and we can't look back and use that scale necessarily now. That makes, that makes sense. Uh, Miranda wants to know, is censure just a congressional process or do other branches use some sort of censure as well? Uh, before I say that, I just, uh, Liz actually made a point that I will make. Uh, oh, yes. And I, um, I did when I was looking up this morning, note this, and I forgot to mention it, is that a lot of the, um, expulsion or censure has to do with Confederates after the Civil War or just before the Civil War. So um, that some, so what do you have to do? Well, actually, you know, treason <laughs> as a thing. Um, so, so some of it, it, a chunk of this stuff happens during the Civil War era. So thank you, Liz, that's actually very true. Um, I'm sorry, so the question that was just asked, oh, do other branches do something like this? Is this, is this purely congressional or is there something, something similar that happens in either other branches or state level? <laughs> I mean, I would assume the answer to that is yes. The fact that this happens in Congress is partly a constitutional matter. It's actually, the Constitution says Congress has the right to um, reprimand or punish its own members. Doesn't say anything about how or for what, but that's an explicit power that's given to Congress. So it's I- It's uniquely constitutionally congressional. It's, it's there may be similar processes, but- I would assume there are all kinds of processes, but but this one is is like right there. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, Gosar was also removed from his committees. Uh, do we know if he can be reinstated when the GOP takes control? Um, I would assume the answer to that is yes. Um, they're also talking about reinstating um, other folk who have not behaved very well and were removed from committees. So I think the answer to that is Yes, um, it's another form of attaboy. No, <laughs> you've behaved badly, and now we're gonna like reward you for that. Um, yeah, I, I think I think so, and I think part of the logic of doing that is explicitly for the insult, you know, the, the, what it means, which is yeah, this person behaved really badly against you, our opponents, and we really like that. So that that's actually um, among other things a statement of party before um, government, right? Because the, the institution of Congress would suggest, you know, if you honor the institution and its rules, you don't do that. So um, this, is, this is, that's a uh, really obviously, but a, a very explicitly party driven in your face kind of gah to, to people who, you know, um, they oppose. And so there's a lot of this, I think it's clear people are thinking about what comes afterward. Um, so you've mentioned several representatives who resigned and then were reelected. Does it see, it, from your perspective, does that seem like a pattern that people tend to do better, maybe win by larger margins? Does that happen? That, that's a bigger pattern that you've noticed that sometimes these folks really do do better after they've been censured and resigned and yeah. reelected? Some of them do, yeah. I mean, you know, it, there's a um, certain percentage of every Congress and the Congresses that I looked at, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, um, that were almost ex like explicitly put in Congress to be fighters. Mm -hmm. 
You know, like, um, I, I know I've used this quote before, I think I have. Um, good old Henry Wise, my most frequent fighter, at one point is um, not formally reprimanded, but someone stands up and says, you know, you ought to be thrown out of this body, you and your, you know, all the trouble that you're making. You should, you shouldn't be here. We should throw you out. And Wise says, um, on the floor, so this is open, um, yeah, well, you know what? You try that because if you throw me out, I will be reelected, put back in here by an enormous margin. Why? I'm put here to behave this way. This is what my constituents want, which is basically true, right? Um, so, you know, he's not expelled ever. Uh, and he's right. If he had been, there would have been like this sort of, you can't do that. You know, an, an interesting thing about the dynamics of Congress is the you can't do that to us um, response sometimes is the most powerful of all, above and beyond morality, above and beyond policy. You know, so like in um, the gag rule debate moment, um, when, you know, basically petitions to Congress are being silenced. So that's a pretty fundamental violation of the right of petition. That's a fundamental American right. It's the point of it is not to do that. The point of it is to shut up talk of attacking slavery in any way. But John C. Adams, really savvy politician, he wants to get to defeat the gag rule. He, do, he for years he tries to defeat the gag rule. And one brilliant decision he makes is Northerners aren't actually going to really care about the anti-slavery component here for the most part. If I say, hey, they're shutting up anti-slavery attacks, they're not going to care. But if I say to people in the North. They're silencing you. Your rights are being violated. They're going to get really mad. And sure enough, that's his pitch. Right of petition. This is against the right of petition. And Northerners are up in arms, right? Like, you can't take away our right of petition. So he's right. The slavery issue is not going to be the one that grabs people. But the people thinking that their rights are being violated? Public steps right up and makes a huge fuss, which ultimately helps bring the gag rule down. That's interesting. And I think, I think we certainly see that, that that political parties look to identify that that issue that really does, in fact, get people that that make them feel, you know, well, yeah. freedom, my rights, right. um, yeah. But that that's a, and I've talked about this a thousand times before here, right? That's that's a, an emotional and a personal mm -hmm. appeal, and there's yeah. almost no way to be more powerful than to get people to feel personally violated in some way that their personal rights are being taken away and that they are being silenced because their representative is being silenced. That's, that's, that's powerful. So you did mention Henry, Henry Wise and that he said that if he was expelled, he would be reelected and that he could, in fact, that could have happened. He, he would have been able to be reelected had he been expelled. Oh yeah. Because so in the time period that um, I'm talking about here, um, Many, many, many members of Congress, it's, it's very unlike now, they're there for one term. There's like, you know, one term wonders that, that they're not well-known people, their career isn't in Congress, they appear and they disappear, and sometimes it's fine, hard to find sort of traces of them. So some people I wrote about, I had to really dig to figure out, like, who is this person? And like the one who said, I'm going to cut your throat from ear to ear, I really had to dig to find him. Um, you know, I ended up finding one portrait of him somewhere, um, and he appears briefly in his state record somewhere. But so in that era, when it's very common to have one term in Congress, Wise has six. Hmm. So he already, and, and as I said, he is the most, by far, the most frequent fighter, renowned for it. As a matter of fact, there's an, a joke that circulates for a while. He's on a committee, um, and it, I, I think the meeting of the committee is delayed for some reason, and the joke that goes around is, well, they're delaying the meeting of the committee because Wise doesn't have his guns yet. They got lost in his luggage, right? So he he's that guy, you know? Um, and he's, he, it, to the point that people are joking about it, um, and he gets reelected again and again and again. He only he leaves Congress when he resigns, when he decides he doesn't want to stay in Congress anymore. This is my own question. When there's that level of violence, I, you hear a lot of talk these days, right? Oh, there's so much, there's dysfunction in Congress, and oh, and and sort of, it's almost this sort of this shameful thing. Like it was great, but now this is just shameful. And uh, it's was there that sort of was that there that sort of talk? at the time, perhaps among elites or certain segments of society that, oh, Congress is just out of control now. It used to be fine, now it's not. 
there was that sort of same sort of disgusted talk that's happening among some communities, yeah. would you say? Yeah, um, I don't think I don't think they necessarily would say, ah, the good old days when it was great. But what they would say is, you know, this is it's out of control. It's crossed lines. And there were all kinds of um, like editorials and newspapers. I remember one that it wasn't intended to be funny, but it kind of was. It's like, you know, these guys, they think like they do whatever they want. And they say, I'm sorry. And that that somehow wipes it all off as if, you know, if they get in a fight and roll in the gutter, that if they stand up and say, oh, that's over, that somehow that takes away the fact that they got in a fight and rolled in the gutter. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, crossing a line and shame and the institution and it's in the press a lot that that kind of talk um john quincy adams uh he has such a long political career and he was in congress for so long he in his diary he talks about the fact that the same thing happens every time one of these moments happens which is there's a fight uh there's something violent there's a moment that clearly crosses a line and um people are called to order everyone sits down they need to sort of figure out what to do and his phrase for what happened next was the lamentation speeches begin and lamentation speeches are what is happening to congress like what we must do something we must change the rules it's always the same and it happens every time and not a lot happens as, as suggested by the fact that he has a nickname for these these moments the lamentation speeches interesting so there's, we've got a, a comment here that, that Congress is in fact a workplace. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it becoming a, what we would now describe as a hostile workplace? Has it, is that how you would describe it? Has it been that way in the past? Um, and what can be done if members don't feel protected? Um, it's a good question. Has it been that way in the past? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, there's a letter I remember reading from a, um, my letter brain right? I may have like citizen brain and historian brain. My letter brain is really powerful. Um, there's a letter from a North Carolina congressman in the 1850s to his wife uh, with a great name. His name is David Outlaw. Um, and actually, David Outlaw is not like his name at all. But um, he kind of jokingly says to his wife, you know, maybe they should just elect big guys into Congress because I feel a little it's like a little uneasy in here. Like I don't really feel fully comfortable in here. Um, so yeah, you know, I think people felt uncomfortable. Sometimes people felt threatened. There were times um, when people felt so uncomfortable that they armed themselves not to be aggressive bullies, but because they were scared. Um, so yeah, you know, but I would say in modern times, so, so the important point I haven't said here is that of course the 19th century, particularly, you know, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, it's a really violent time just in America, like rioting and, you know, all kinds of stuff, voting uh, riots during elections and anti-immigrant violence and all kinds of stuff going on. So part of what we're seeing in Congress reflects the United States at that time. So that's, that's some of what we're looking at. I just forgot where I was going. Where was I? Where was I? We were headed? just talking about hostile workplaces. And, oh, yes. and yes, it is That's hostile now say. and it felt hostile then. Well, right. What I was going to say is in, in 19th century America, um, it fit in with the times, whereas we don't live in that. Yeah. You know, that it's a different world. It's violent. I'm not saying it isn't, but views towards that kind of violence are different. And so, yes. right. And so because of that, that means that whatever's going on in Congress has a different cast to it. So it might not have seemed as horrible then. Um, and now it, there's a different meaning and a different power for that kind of behavior. Yeah, that's very, <clears throat> very interesting. Um, in the past, so they're very, obviously in the times you write about, they're very gendered spaces. Do women write about behavior in Congress? And I, I imagine that they, they view and speak about that differently than men might. Well, indeed. Um, so um, the first woman reporter allowed into the reporter's gallery, the press gallery, um, take, so she, um, I always get her, her name mixed up. I'm going to get it wrong. and I'm going to feel really bad. Um, I'm going to have to look it up because I'm going to get it wrong. And I want to give her credit. I've talked about her before. Um, she's, she's aggressively trying to get women into the press and give get them she wants to be 
the person who allows women to get into the press gallery. So she kind of forces her way in there. The day that she joins the press gallery is the day in the Senate when um, Henry Foote pulled a gun on Thomas Hart Benton in the Senate. That's her first day in the, <laughs> and so, you know, she sees this and she writes about it. Um, and she writes, you know, her account is like many an account. There's nothing about it that you would read it and say, it's feminine in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and she does say, you know, something that, um, I know, uneventful first day. So, yeah. Um, and, I, and I have to say that that moment when uh, Foote pulls a gun on, on Benton, that, like that's quite a thing. So, you know, um, Foote insults Benton, Benton leaps out of his chair and sort of rushes towards foot, knocks over his chair, like knocks glass off of his desk in his rushing towards foot, and foot pulls a gun and begins to back away, right? And and the chaos in the galleries and you know, it's it's quite a thing. Um, and then it's ultimately someone takes the gun away and everybody sits down. She writes about this and she, you know, you you hear it in a nice in a, a powerful way with the glass breaking and the noise and everything. And she says something in her column that's like, you know, there, there you see the product of a Southern education or some such thing about Henry Foote, which is kind of like Giddings, right? I give yeah. you ladies and gentlemen. And the people who are unhappy, particularly Southerners who are unhappy with what she says, essentially go in the like, there you go, like a woman, it's like sounding like a woman, you know, sounding like hysterical and making, there's nothing about it that sounds female, but they immediately grab at that to kind of dismiss her. So interesting that that is fascinating yeah i did see the note to thank you all to save the chat yes oh yes indeed I'm, i always try to do that too and then i forget to go back but i like to have because i miss the chat because <laughs> i'm talking so much i miss the chat. oh we're almost we're just about out of time yes gosh okay so then let me do my end of time thing here um so uh we are now going to segue into the after party. Um, and what that means is, for those of you who are new, uh, is that we will stop recording what we're doing here so that we can be a little bit more off the cuff uh, and we can continue the conversation or chat about whatever you want to chat about. Um, and if you are on Facebook and want to join the after party, you can't stay on Facebook. You have to leave Facebook and you have to join the after party by joining online through nchetech.org slash conversations so if you leave facebook chat. come back oh there it is look at that um so if you join through that link you can join the after party uh and so for those of you uh, joining the after party i will see you that's right i didn't say what i always say which is in about a minute we're going to poof become the after party just because that's just fun to say um at any rate um those of you who are going to join the after party i will see you in a moment uh those of you who will not uh, as always, I want to thank you um, for coming. Uh, these conversations are important, uh, particularly at a time when democracy is under attack in a variety of different ways. The public getting together to talk about what's going on and the ability for people to step in with the public and, and really set in context the meaning of what's going on, that really matters a lot. It's why I'm here every week for 85 weeks. Um, but it is, that's what makes me come. Uh, is because I, I, I don't know what else I can do uh, b beyond what I'm doing to sort of be with folks and be with you guys and have us come together and actually try and understand what's going on as it's happening and ideally give you guys the fodder to deal with it and confront it in useful and powerful ways. So as always, I want to thank you guys uh, for being here. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving week. Um, there will be not a live episode next week, but there will be a recorded episode because I'm not going to like give up my streak, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so there will be where well, the community might or might not be present. Actually, it might, I, I think it can be right that you air it and that people can, I have no idea. At any rate, there's going to be a live episode and somehow or other we will get, not a live episode, there will be an episode and I will yeah. communicate to you um, the how it'll happen and where it'll come from so that there will be an 86th episode next week. It'll be on the usual website and we'll also make sure that it's widely shared on social media. So you will, I, I challenge you to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be tweeting about it actively. So anyway, have a wonderful holiday to everybody. Um, and those of you who are sticking around, 
we'll have we'll party and we do thank joanne so much because truly history matters and and you have you have been out there joanne sharing all the ways in which history truly does matter at this moment in our democracy so we thank well, you thank for you. that thank you and on that serious note we're now going to again switch to party mode and i'm turning off recording <laughs>